Um, welcome everyone, thank you for attending to this talk. Um, well, sort of a talk. Yeah, it's, 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 thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a continuous work in progress talk, so that's hands to spread. Okay, um, so my name is Antoine, I've been uh, with OpenBSD for uh, 10 plus years. Yeah. My name is Baptiste, I'm on FreeBSD for a while now, a uh, member of the core team, and uh, doing stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so before we start, um, we want to explain a little bit how uh, the idea of this talk uh, came to us. So, um, basically it was a, a nice warm day uh, in the summer, we were outside having uh, yeah, tea, and yeah, yeah, yeah. small tea and sponge cake, something like that. Yeah. So they were, as usual, talking about something like the ponies, unicorns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which one and first first and stuff like this. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we're just going to be discussing the, uh, the ponies and unicorn, indeed. And, um, well, okay. No. Well, it's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it was uh, like midnight. Well, I'm more 2 a.m. Okay, it was like 2 a.m. in a random pub somewhere. Uh, we were having, uh, like, Tenth bite of Heineken, something? No, 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 we're in, in Japan, you can't say that. It was more Azahi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, okay, okay. So, so I started complaining that the Azahi didn't have any flavor. Yeah, okay, so Heineken. <laughs> no flavor of Heineken. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I started complaining that the Heineken had no flavor, and that's why it hit me. I was like, oh my god, no flavor. That's not you guys, it's not, it's not free BSD. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, free BSD has no flavor. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so um, flavor is an awesome concept. Um, I'm not aware of any other package manager in a Unix land uh, that comes with it, or at least offers the same functionality. Uh, basically, it allows you to provide packages compiled with a different set of options. Uh, so that's very convenient from a dependency point of view, because uh, you will be only using the options uh, that you want. Um, and you want to be able to control what the packages are providing. Um, sometimes it's very hard to do, because you have to, to compromise what set of options you are actually shipping in your packages, and that's where the flavor is kicking. Um, for example, you may want to install SendMail with or without support for uh, SASL uh, or LDAP or whatever, or you want both uh, options in it. So while it's fine when you're compiling, when you're distributing packages, uh, it's uh, much harder to uh, choose uh, uh, on the fly. Um, it's different. Uh, it's a different concept from sub-packages. Uh, sub-packages are just basically split package. Uh, so these are typically used when you have a software that comes with a huge amount uh, of data, for example, like uh, audio for, for or graphic or games. Uh, these usually don't change, what the code may change uh, quite often. Uh, it can also be used for things that ship modules or add components, uh, like PHP module, for example. So uh, what we do usually on OpenBSD is that we compile that kind of packages with all the options, and then at the end, uh, we split the packages into like uh, 20 different ones. Yeah, so for, for FreeBSD, for PHP, for example, I think we're pretty much the same. We don't have sub packages, but I mean, we try to build them, so we have multiple packages for the end user, just PHP, IMAP, whatever. Um, but okay, but that means that you have to build uh, each PHP module not one by Yes, and run the computer and extract. And okay. Yeah, that's pain. But there is work in progress right now to get uh, sub package and flavors in port three. I worked on that for a while and then I gave up and then I'm going back on it. And so I'm at the moment where I'm back on it. Okay. Um, so, okay. So if I need uh, SASL support in OpenML on FreeBSD, for example, I, I assume I need to build it myself. That's fine. Okay. Well, we'll my friend, what will happen when I run package update and package upgrade? Well, it will remove your lab. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, we're working on that. Um, so the, the reason why it's very hard to, to get the flavors and the, and the packages into a FreeBSD is uh, because we have a lot of external scripts that depend on that. 
uh, that depend on um, the, the, the behavior that the package might be identified by the unique ID, uh, which is for us the origin of the package, which is very bad because if you have flavors, then you get multiple packages coming from the same directory. If you have some packages, you have multiple packages coming from the same directory. And um, we'll, I mean, we'll have to either kill those, those tools, like Portmaster or PowerGrid, or get someone to get into it to fix them to do that. So now the plan is not wait for those tools. Depend on the thing, make sure that the other tools are up to date. But that reminds me, um, you guys, you do not even support uh, upgrading packaging on the uh, packet. Upgrading packages on, this, on a given release. Well, actually, we do support upgrading uh, packages on a given release. What we don't provide are the pre-compiled packages themselves. Uh, so it's true that you need some kind of uh, public box or, or, or build cluster or something uh, to build your spelling packages. Uh, we're, we're not providing them yet. There's uh, there's work in progress in this area. Um, it's mostly finding the right people and the right infrastructure. Do that, but uh, it will eventually uh, happen. Maybe in 6.1, probably 6.2. Um, talking about package editor, it's, it's important to note that uh, on OpenBSD, everything uh, is done as a different user. Uh, all when you install a package, all the fetching phase, the uh, installation phase, the, the everything uh, uses a different user. So that's a, that's a good indication, I'd say. Um, what about you? On, on, on FreeBSD, actually, uh, for the package itself, we actually use pretty, we sandbox everything we can through Capsicum. We have some drive privileges wherever we want. Actually, we've uh, bitten you guys on the dropping privileges on the package. Something like we did it three or four days before you did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. matching mine. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, uh, back to the, uh, the topic of upgrading. Um, we do try very hard to provide proper upgrade path for our users. Um, the difference is that the difference is that we don't have to deal with a uh, legacy or a maintained version uh, or maintained maintain wrapper. Sorry, again, it's uh, the package tool and stuff like that. Because we don't, we, we don't have, a, we never have stuff like port master or port or whatever. Uh, our package tools are really, really made uh, for providing uh, proper binary packages. Well, this is also true on FreeBSD now. Um, most of the tools you are speaking about are mostly used to for the people that use the post tree directly, and they just because they never catched up yet on the on the binary package. We're pushing how to get the binary package and to get proper tools officially supported to build your own package if you want, like put here. And um, well, um, most of the tool uh, you were speaking about. So as for the post tree, which I'm totally lost in my scripts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's a usage which is not uh, supported on OpenBSD, and uh, you don't update the, from the post tree, you only support from the packages. Uh, we are going in the same direction. So, um, so regarding the, uh, the package, uh, we only support the uh, current release. Uh, so currently for OpenBSD is the 6.0 release. Uh, we only support these packages, uh, only update uh, these, uh, these packages. Um, again, we're not providing them, we're only committing to CBS uh, uh, on stable branch. Um, so each release is tied to this, this own branch. Uh, that's a design decision. We don't want uh, our user to, uh, to be forced to upgrade to a new major uh, version of a package while running a particular release. So we're not using like, a rolling release model for, for packages. So I think that's quite a difference between, uh, between what you guys are doing. And, uh, and considering the fact that we have regular releases every six months, uh, that means that packages don't really have time to get for anymore. Um, so while I'm at it, uh, uh, let me tell you a bit about our support policy. Um, so as I said, packages are only supported for current release, uh, but the base system is supported for the current release, obviously, and uh, the N minus one. So that means five nine and, uh, and six one right now. So it's true that that means that if you run OpenBSD in production, you may want to upgrade every year. 
because that's how long the radius is supported. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I'd rather upgrade often in small stead that, uh, than using uh, uh, some kind of LTS uh, version that will that explodes all my configuration after five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not saying that there's no use for it. I'm just saying that I don't want to be the one who, who uh, administrate uh, such machine. So. Um, well, what about you, guys? Yeah, what, what's your uh, your policy? Like extend support versus uh, versus normal support. How can a 3DSD 10.1 was still supported when 10.2 wasn't or something like that? It's uh, super confusing. No, that's easy. I can explain you. So basically, we had the the normal uh, supported releases. So normal supported releases were releases published on the over from the stable branch. Were supported either supported by the 3DSD officer or security officer for uh, a minimum of one month after release, uh, or and for sufficient additional time if needed to ensure that it is uh, that there is a newer release for at least three months before uh, the older normal release expires. That's for the normal. And we got the extended version. And so the extended version is, uh, I had to quote the website to <laughs> remember. So the extended version was selected releases, normally every second release plus the last release from each table branch where uh, were supported by the security officer for a minimum of 24 months after a release and uh, sufficient additional time if needed to ensure that there is a newer extended release for at least three months before the older extended release expires. That's all. See, now I want to try. Yeah. <laughs> now, so, yeah, that was the old policy and that's exactly the reason why we changed that because no one could understand that. So now we have a very simple policy uh, which basically say, uh, we will keep a uh, given branch for an equivalent of five years, and we will issue release whenever we want in the middle. And as soon as we release, let's say 11.1, 11.0, we we'll get uh, not supported, we'll, get, we'll remain supported for two or three months, and then people do the upgrade, and then we we'll start the support. So we'll have one per one per branch. Okay, but doesn't that mean that you're keeping your feature out of the hand of the users? Because it can be years before they actually actually release a new release or something. Well, actually, with our development model, what we do is we merge a feature as, as much as we can on the previous branch. What we provide on the given branch is uh, the fact that it will be stable in the ADI. So for the new tools, we can provide them for everything we can provide them. The thing is, if you have built something on FreeBSD 1.0 and you want to write on FreeBSD uh, 11.1, Nine, yeah. then it will work at a button you don't have to rebuild because you have exactly the same ADI. Okay, yeah, well, we, we do think completely differently. I mean, we're not afraid of uh, breaking binary compatibilities and stuff like that. So, I mean, we, 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 don't, we don't really do backboard on current as, uh, either. So, uh, um, yeah. Well. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Given, given, we, given we support binary upgrade, it is very easy for on FreeBSD to upgrade from a minor version to a, to a new minor version. Uh, they are tool that we call a FreeBSD update. It is also easy to go from a minor version to a major version uh, the same way. Uh, but, I mean... <laughs> about OpenBSD, uh, you don't support binary upgrades even for security fixes? Okay, um, that's not entirely true. Um, binary upgrades between releases are perfectly supported. Right. It's actually the supported way of doing things. Uh, what's not supported uh, are in-place upgrades during a release cycle. Um, that works pretty much the same as packages, is that we provide a, a CVS patch and you have to recompile yourself. Uh, that said, your great process of OpenBSD is really one of the easiest and fastest uh, that I've ever worked with. Seriously, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's super fast. It's basically just boot the run this kernel, press enter like three times, and, um, and, and, and with the auto installer and auto updater, you don't even have to do anything. Yeah, but what about security fixes? Security fixes, you get a patch for now. And you have to build yourself? That you have to build yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's not very really convenient in pollution, I guess. No, no, that's true. Um, well, okay. We're, 
we are working on a tool that's called Syspatch uh, that will hopefully become a technology preview in uh, 6.1. Uh, so the way it works, that we're, we're not providing binary patches per se because it's not like a binary diff, uh, but we are providing a small toggle with uh, updated binaries or libraries, whatever uh, that, that, uh, that uh, patch needs. On um, is the uh, the way the binary that are actually uh, really done is always uh, in place. You don't upgrade the way you do it, it is in place. So you're running your system and say, I'll everything. And then uh, you first, I mean, you're going across releases. You go from FreeBSD 11 to FreeBSD 12. Then you you fetch everything, and then you install a new kernel. You reboot on it. So you're on the old user land, and then you install a new user land, and you're upgrading. It's very simple and very nice. And, and very slow. And also that's true because we do that through binary diffs and when you go from a release to another release you get gigantic binary diff and you get to go through the entire binaries for that. But that's the reason we are also aiming at having uh, packaging uh, pack, uh, package uh, do the upgrade instead of free as uh, in the future. Um, I would say that there is only one case where in-place upgrades are might be painful uh, is the fact that you need at any moment to be compatible with the user and it needs to be uh, compatible with the previous one. And for things like ZFS, it used to be an issue because uh, the the Illumos developer uh, have the same mind as you have guys about how should be an upgrade. So you have your kernel and your user and are very tied to a given release, and so you switch everything at once. And when we, we bring back new features from uh, ZFX into uh, our new kernel, we bring a tool as well, but when you're great, there is some time where you don't have any, we had to re on the compatibility. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I do agree that in place of great and, uh, and be interesting. Um, although, although your particular process is quite slow. Um, but, I mean, in theory, uh, in place of great and nice if you want to prevent like the long down times because you can you can keep uh, uh, servicing whatever you're servicing on the box while getting. Uh, but in reality, I mean production is supposed to be resilient, so you should be able to uh, put the machine down and, and take the time to upgrade it if needed. Um, so uh, that's why I don't really see the point. I mean, technically, it's interesting uh, for real life usage. I I don't see what advantage uh, it brings. Yeah. Another policy, um, let's switch to another policy we have it on FreeBSD, which is very important, and it's related to what you said before, like uh, long-term support, and I don't want to deal with those micro files that have been totally different and I've merged, is we have a policy called the POLA principle of uh, release management, and across releases, across everything, we're supposed to be very, very careful about what we change, how we change, so that the user can have an upgrade pass, which is, uh, Easy to deal with, and a, and a great should be straightforward. Yeah, okay. Well, Bola is, Bola is okay, but I mean, it's, it's all right as long as it doesn't go against, against the, uh, the the basic security practice. Uh, like, for example, just to, to, uh, to satisfy, satisfy the uh, third party SSH client, uh, you guys get TSA encryption, ASCDC, SSH protocol one for like, years after it was disabled from, uh, from the stream, right? Well, it's, it's not entirely true that this is Polar that, that make that, because Polar doesn't prevent us from doing that. It was well, for reasons. If I quote the exact comment, it was remove DSA from default, that, that when we remove it, remove DSA from default cipher list and disable SSH1, blah, blah, blah. SSH1 in FreeBSD for reason which boils down to Polar. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, Polar, the problem with Polar is it also becomes an excuse each time you want to enforce something. So if you read properly Polar on the website, it's pretty clear what it is about. It's just about don't surprise the user if you don't, don't surprise the user without warning them long, long enough in advance. That's basically all the what is Polar about. And you're able to make big changes. It's not a problem as long as you have the documentation, the red pass, and the user have been warned. Okay, so. I think we are enough with the bad policy. I think this because you, you spoke a bit about uh, something which was not really cool for us. So, well, how is your SMP support? Okay, how is your SMP support and your scheduling? Well, 
<laughs> okay, for re regular, like let's say desktop usage, uh, or big log SMP implementation model, uh, like curl log, is honestly good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. The reason is that most of the time on the workstation, you only have a handful uh, amount of cores, like between two and eight usually, and only one socket. So our actual scaler isn't bad, it's just that it's a bit old and it was written for real SMP machines, meaning that it does not consider, the, like for example, the cache distance uh, between cores. And that's one of the, the reasons why machines with uh, several sockets uh, often have not that great performance uh, on OpenBSD. Uh, there are lots of people ping pong involved, so yeah. Uh, so we can use like 24 cores, uh, but uh, in the context of like for example, building packages, uh, it's way better to use like 12 two cores machine than the one with 24 cores. Yeah, something something I don't understand with your current model of releases every six months, and that how can you catch up on the, on the SMP uh, without um, taking a lot of time to do it and then delaying some releases? If I think the path that 3DSD took at the time, I mean, we ended up with some very fantastic releases like 3DSD 5. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not saying that the, the road we took when we went to SMP is uh, the, the one true way, but I really can, I cannot see how you can do that in an incremental way. Uh, okay, no, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, a few things can be incremental, uh, which is what we've been doing with the, uh, the, the network unlocking, for example. Uh, a, a big part has been reverted just so before release to, uh, to make sure that uh, we don't actually introduce uh, uh, regression. Um, but I guess I guess we'll, well, we'll have to, at some point we'll have to uh, to uh, to commit everything at once at the beginning of a release cycle, and, uh, and, and we'll only have yeah we we'll only have six months uh, to uh, to test that. Uh, but, um, to go back to the scheduling stuff, uh, several issues with OpenBSD uh, come from the, don't come especially from uh, the SMP implementation or stuff like that. Also comes from uh, the, uh, the the speed, there's a speed pin locking, sorry, in our uh, uh, pin thread uh, implementation. Uh, there are actually, all these issues are actually being worked on, but uh, they're tough, it takes time, and uh, so. So yeah. So sure. I, I mean, our raw performance is not on board with uh, with uh, previously. Uh, that, that's for sure. But that's it's not as bad as uh, usually people think it is. Well, to be honest, uh, SMP is something that is always evolving. And well, for example, previously, right now, our next changes are everything uh, related to Numa. And I have a lot to catch up on it. Uh, we are also working a lot on improving um, the overall looking system by. Uh, having more and more atomic logs where we can. We introduced recently a concurrency kit which will uh, help us uh, in that direction. Uh, what is the status on the GSD right now for your, uh, on the, the work you've done on SMP? Uh, well, I mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the network uh, work uh, to, uh, to uh, actually put out the, uh, the, the, all the network path from the, uh, the kernel up, the giant part. Uh, our entire SCSI stack is uh, is uh, fully SMP, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, as I said, it's hard. It takes time, um, and we eventually will get there because uh, there are actually more and more people that are interested in doing the work. So, um, yeah. Tell you where you, where you're here. Um, can you explain me something I never understand about the LDSD? Uh, you seem to keep writing your own tools for everything all the time, even if there is BSD equivalent counterparts. I mean, are, aren't you suffering some kind of NIH syndrome? I don't think so. Uh, it's actually a good question. Um, I'm glad you asked because there are, uh, in my opinion, very objective reason that we're doing that. Uh, the first one is that we have a coding style, we have a coding practice, uh, and, and as well. Yeah, sure, but that we want to follow. Uh, we want our daemon, and especially like the network daemon, to follow a real, really important coding practice. Uh, 
So that's one of the reasons. Uh, another reason is that obviously control, uh, that you're not like uh, at the mercy of uh, an upstream project that will suddenly change its licensing or something. Um, and of course, uh, there's also security and, and not of checking and stuff like that. But if you take a, if you take a, a open NTP, for example, uh, sure that there's the reference implementation that existed since like, forever and that we used to have. Uh, but when you look at NTPD, look at how many uh, uh, CVEs it had in the, in the past years. Uh, same with the, with the open SSL and LibreSSL. SSL. Uh, I mean, Bernard uh, pulled it and, uh, the, and the talk before. So, uh, um, and if I'm not mistaken, actually, most uh, of the uh, CVEs that uh, you guys had uh, recently have been related to like the NTPD. So that, that's one of the reasons uh, we would do that. Right. Uh, for ports, it's not being spoken about, it makes sense. Uh, but I mean, when you have uh, no BSD quality or the BSD quality alternatives, I agree, it could make sense. But I mean, there was something what about Beehive, for example. Well, I mean, it was working, it was, uh, it, it could be easily fit the security requirement, uh, sandboxing, whatever. So why yet another implementation? Well, um, <laughs> Actually, the, the, there's been an initial uh, pointing effort uh, a few years ago, uh, which ended up uh, stopping after a week. Uh, it's like uncompilable or something like that. Uh, it was it was basically very hard to port. Um, so it was actually better to just stop from scratch. Okay? And if after a week you're not able to uh, to compile uh, just uh, one tenth of the code, and there's there's no point. Uh, maybe things have changed since, since uh, now even macOS has a implementation right? uh, behind. So may, may, maybe things have changed, but that, that was that was one of the, the, the reasons. Another reason is what I mentioned earlier as well. So. Right, but another the example would be Capsicum. You decide to make your own sandboxing mechanism instead of porting it? Um, well, yeah, okay. Uh, all right, since, since you brought the subject of security, uh, let's talk about it, and uh, let's talk about the uh, sandboxing stuff a bit later then. Um, so to correlate what I was saying, that's to why we're writing ARM even. Uh, most of our volume, at least all the important ones, uh, run with a privilege separation. Uh, most of the code is run through it, and as a non-privileged user, um, OpenSSH, uh, like the way we stock it actually, um, and they also use privilege revocation uh, for dropping privilege as, as soon as possible. Um, and when you look at NTPE again, um, it's, a, it's a perfect example of what uh, an OpenBSD even is. Um, so it was written with the principle of this privilege in mind. Uh, and not only it does brave set and brave drop, but in addition it has a completely privilege separated uh, TLS speaker for the uh, constraint feature. And constraint feature is actually pretty fun. Uh, that you, you ask for an HTTPS website somewhere on the internet at uh, the time, and you compare it with what the NTP, uh, so what NTP server uh, gets to you. So. Yeah, but I mean, for ATP, you are right, but the price of having a half baked implementation, when I cannot authenticate the peers, uh, it is receiving the type from, uh, using standardized mechanism that are already existing for that. Uh, you're missing half of the features that the database is supposed to provide. But yes, I agree. Most for most of them, people don't care. Yeah, that's that's exactly um, uh, that's exactly the strength. Of, uh, well, that's it. I would like to get rid of NTPD of the original NTPD anyway on any system. But that was the same. I mean, okay, actually, at some point, you need to ask yourself if, if, if the, the fact that you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. Uh, I'm not saying that there are not uh, several uh, use cases for the uh, reference implementation. I'm just saying that by default, I don't think uh, 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 using the, the uh, traditional NTP uh, makes any sense. Uh, if, if, sure, if you're running like a, like a atomic clock, whatever, or, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, um, and since we're uh, talking about, uh, about security, um, well, OpenBSD is very well known for all these uh, is, uh, uh, exploit mitigation techniques. Uh, it's important to note that all of these have been enabled, have been enabled by default for years uh, and are very hard or even impossible uh, to disable. Uh, I'll use a few examples, like they're non-exhaustive, but uh, we, have, uh, we have ASLR, 
to rearrange the address space to prevent the buffer overflows, for example. We have WXRX. Uh, so the main page can be, uh, can be uh, either uh, writable X or executable. Uh, it's been in kernel since years, and now it's uh, it's in user land, uh, which is uh, control. You can you can disable it uh, if needed. That's what we do for ports. Um, but when when I mean, instead of, of, of uh, exiting the port, uh, that, that does a double X or X. Uh, uh, we actually not uh, um, log it, so we can actually fix it, uh, and people can still use uh, daily open DSD instead of having a program crash all the time. Uh, we've had propolis, the stack machine protection for years, uh, position independent, executable, high. Uh, we have a strong random uh, number generator. Um, basically, the way we develop things is that we always assume that we are um, running in a hostile environment. Even if it's controlled by us, so um, that's what started our instant uh, source audit, uh, which started like 20 more than 20 years ago and is still ongoing. Uh, that allowed us to detect unsafe pattern. Uh, that teached us how not to write uh, demons and stuff like that. So um, I actually invite people to look at the uh, the Fiora uh, Rush presentation uh, about the exploit mitigation technique. Uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, you guys, you look like uh, in previous either like next to non-existent. Right? Well, um, on FreeBSD we have a strong random generator. We have also properties. Uh, it's on by default. Um, yeah, we don't have ISOI yet. There is, uh, there is an implementation that we didn't review. I'm not speaking about the random BSD one because I don't know much of this one. But the others in review should be in. I hope pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on the side of security we have, we have a very good uh, Mac framework, which is uh, access control uh, on your system. It allows you to uh, restrict entirely uh, what a user can see on the system uh, to, uh, to nothing. You can really isolate a lot of stuff. Uh, we have kind of firewall-like policy on the file system itself with that. We can restrict access to the network that plays nice with uh, IDS. Um, we can limit uh, the scope of one process can see by compartmentalizing them into what we call partitions uh, and then way more things into, uh, into the Mac framework. Another interesting feature we have is the OpenBSM. Uh, it's an audit system, so you can run uh, an audit demo on every single of your, of your box. Uh, get, a, get a server where all your audits are sent to and you can analyze what happened on the server at, the at any moment of the time. So that's very, that's very nice. Okay. And now what about uh, what about capsicum? What about capsicum? Yeah. We have capsicum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so on the capsicum part, capsicum is a very nice sandboxing mechanism and we have uh, we have in FreeBSD that uh, leverage the content of capability. Um, what is really nice about it is once you return the sandbox, there is no way to exit that sandbox. Even the child process are inside that sandbox. Uh, and that can be inherit uh, the capabilities from, uh, from, the first, from the other process. Um, it is really designed uh, for developers to secure their own application by strictly restricting and restricting, restricting the capability uh, on the application to only what it needs to be able to do. Not to a family of things, but really what it needs to do. Um, we have started converting most of the base system to use it, uh, but we are not entirely yet uh, at the point where everything is converted uh, because the capsicum design allows no compromise. And I mean, it is always easy to it is not always easy to convert something to capsicum due to that, but there is no compromise on security in capsicum. Okay. Yeah. Sure. But I mean. If the, if the stuff is too complex for most people, uh, then it doesn't get much use by default. So, I mean, if you compare it to Plex, for example, uh, of course it's not the same. Uh, capabilities versus like something else. Uh, <laughs> plus, say complex. Uh, or set of uh, it's, no. Okay. Well, um, 
It's, it's, a, it's a good summary again, uh, Pledge, of uh, what OpenGSD is. It's, uh, for me, it's really uh, uh, affordable security. Uh, by affordable, I mean it's simple, uh, it's easy to implement, and hence it's actually uh, enabled uh, everywhere. I mean, uh, after after a couple of, uh, like two or three weeks, I think, like 20% of the base system was already pledged or something like that. Uh, today we're like 85 to 90% uh, of the base system. Uh, and we also have some uh, some uh, some port like a Chromium, for example. And uh, I think there was more uh, Firefox that was not done. Uh, anyway, Pledge was uh, designed to be very easy uh, for the programmer to add support for for it in the, in the software. Uh, otherwise, no one uh, would have uh, would have used it. Um, so it, it not only does that, but it also encourage uh, uh, refactoring your software towards uh, a more secure uh, uh, model. Um, and it actually also made us find a whole bunch of really weird stuff in software. Right? Like there was some weird thing in VI, I don't remember what it was, but uh, anyway. Uh, so in theory, capability base security may be more advanced, uh, it probably is, uh, but what was the feature if it's too complex to be widely implemented? Well, I don't think it is too complex. Uh, it just doesn't fit it the same area, and I think both are complementary, uh, both kind of. Uh, another feature we have of FreeBSD for a long while, which actually got the trend now under the name of container, uh, but we have the jails. Uh, the, the FreeBSD jail allowed to create a prison container, um, which uh, will in, in which you can uh, restrict a lot of things. You can apply some resource uh, limitation on network or system, CPU. Uh, memory, routing tables, uh, it, can, it can also be nested now. Uh, you can also delegate uh, some write on ZFS inside a jail subject and another zone data set and stuff like this. Okay. Well, in that regard, I, I do agree with Suck. We have no container like technology. Okay, yeah, there was an initial effort like years ago uh, by using a uh, Sysjail. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, it was a race condition and it's pretty much useless. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move to something else. Yeah. So we talked about the base system a bit, uh, secu security. Um, I had an actual look at your base system the other day, and uh, what's the deal with the Libexo? Well, Libexo is actually pretty cool, pretty useful sometimes. So Libexo is uh, something that make, that allows the program to output some uh, program readable output, so then you can pipe easily and stuff like this. Yeah, okay, but, but is this really needed? Uh, not really big, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I was going to say, does LS really need a big so? Yeah, so LS, LS, I don't think it really, uh, well, LS actually there is one thing uh, that would might need the big so, because um, in theory, you don't want the output of LS, because every single programming language has the ability to, <laughs> to, to walk through a file system and do things. There is one thing which is never implemented in, uh, in every single uh, programming language, taking the CH flex, which is an extension map on the BSDs. Uh, the thing is, I'm not sure that anyone really cares about that. So the case of LS is probably a bad case. Uh, I think we have words, we have, the, uh, we have uh, ID. ID? Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so now please explain this. <laughs> Yeah, so that's true. What is that? <laughs> well, I'll pull the, pull the story for that one. We discovered that one in EuroBSDCon last year. Where, uh, Stefan was uh, doing a talk about uh, merging between BSD, and he, he pointed out the difference in between the two comments, and then we all thought it was a bug in the slide. <laughs> and we check. And so, and actually, uh, uh, yeah, for this one, I have no argument. I can agree that it is over engineering. Yeah, okay. it, yeah. So we do agree on that. On this one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> on the coma. <laughs> well, come on. I mean, if you you, you mentioned you just mentioned jail. I mean, if I if I 
use that example uh, for GL administration. They have like 10 plus different software in the port structure. Why can't you just include a good one, import it, and, and, and be done with it? Well, uh, we have a good one actually for the GELs. Uh, the GEL command itself can do everything, and there is now a configuration file. It does everything it doesn't do is a provisioning. But I mean, the provisioning is on the job. Sure, but then you have 10 different software that do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, okay, but what, what I mean is that can be very confusing to know which tool to use. Uh, I mean, I, I actually tried a, a couple of weeks ago to uh, set up a gel, and I didn't know actually how to, to, to do it. Uh, I mean, that, I, I, I could do it because there are like a thousand how tools on the internet, uh, but I didn't know which one would be better. Uh, the same with the firewall. You guys have three firewalls. Why are there you two using IPFW that was written by and for people? Why do you need the, the other two? Yeah, it's so, uh First, the example back to the gel, you say, well, all the example tools we have are providing extra features like provisioning, and we don't need, we don't actually need that uh, in the base system. Uh, it would be nice if we have something which is unique, but given you can have, I, I don't know, uh, ZFS based uh, provisioning or something different based on, uh, uh, it will be complicated to get something that covers all the cases. So having just the comment that does that start, stop, and run it properly is enough, in my opinion. Uh, if I want the gel, I'll just extract file, extract it wherever I want, and just start done. It's one line in a conversion file, so I don't, I don't really agree that uh, this one's complicated. Because I think the firewall, well, true IPFW have been, has been developed for and by a free, by a free easy developer, but for all of us, there are people willing to maintain them, and they are trying hard to maintain them. So. It doesn't bother us to have the choice here. We have flexibility. And actually, it, bring, it brought a uh, pretty nice uh, feature it, so that the, we made an abstraction layer so that the firewall can plug in the right place uh, through the next feature. So it's nice sometimes to have choice where it gives you a good uh, abstraction layer. And if one day we want to totally drop what we have and come with a fresh new one, it comes here very nicely. Three, five, one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you won't convince me on that one. I mean, we, we like simplicity, so uh, I, I agree that we may need a few features here and there from time to time, but uh, we're ready to, uh, to accept uh, a less amount of, less amount of features uh, if it means that our implementation is simple and self-contained. And, and uh, for us, the complexity is a worse enemy of security, uh, which is one of our primary goals. So. And also, we're, we're a bunch of stupid people, so we like to think that simple. Well, flexibility doesn't mean complexity, uh, not always mean complexity. Uh, it can also be like, we can do it in a, in a simple manner. So, in my opinion, okay. What about this one? <laughs> I don't think that's really interesting. Citizen. Uh, if we're just speaking about the fire system, the other we do support is uh, we have um, the yeah. fire system, uh, the, X, uh, the Linux X fire system, and uh, with write support, with end control, but with write support. Uh, and we have also an end, uh, an end, an end fire system, which is for uh, embedded yeah, devices. Yeah. Well, I'm going to we're pretty much stuck with the, uh, the, the traditional uh, UFS fire system. Um, that said, it's been it's extremely stable for us. So after 15 plus years of putting open this in production, never lost a fight. Maybe I'm just lucky, but I don't trust it. Same here on control systems. We obviously support stuff like NFS. Um, we don't support NFS before because that would require a GSS API implementation. Um, our auto mounter is still the uh, original one, so the default AMD. Uh, I would welcome a more modern implementation for sure. Uh, 
we have an iSCSI uh, initiator uh, implementation. Uh, I would not argue that file system is not really where we shine. Uh, it's, it's against something where we not. We don't have a very good performance. Uh, but that said, it's very stable. The uh, thing is that we don't have uh, journaling. Uh, we do have soft update, but we do have bugs. Uh, Ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, you guys have curve, so there's no way we can do <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, on FreeBSD under the hood, um, we have the GM framework, which is a very powerful thing that gives us um, to port for a lot of features like multipass, encryption, we have two encryption actually, GLE, GDBE, uh, mirroring to G-mirror, uh, even network transform to G-gate. Um, and there is also, uh, uh, you know, where is that layer? You can also provide things which are very useful to do some testing, like with the genome thing, you can face some hardware failures, random uh, writes that goes anywhere. So that's very useful. We have a very, very good support for iSCSI targets through a CTLD, can control target layer, can, uh, can target layer, um, which also supports uh, high availability over iSCSI, so that's very nice. Very performant, we have a good initiator. Our network file system are, have a very good support for all the NFS version, including the latest for the two, um, for both side server and clients, obviously. Uh, we do provide uh, nati native tools to, provide, to deal uh, well, to talk and to manipulate the storage. Yeah. So for this device, most of the LSI cards, we don't need to have those, this dirty, ugly tool officially provided yeah, yeah. by Blog, we have the proper tool for that. So as a client of storage, we also have the, we still have the traditional AMD, uh, but we have a very new, shiny AutoFS support with the AMD does a lot of cool things. Uh, and that is only speaking about the user facing feature and utility. Going down, it's even better. Okay. Uh, there's something I forgot to mention is a software uh, red, uh, which is in very good shape on, uh, on OpenBSD. Uh, but I'm going to make you a present. Um, we cannot boot from Red Pie. <laughs> really? Yes. A little bit embarrassing. Yeah. But on Christian, as I said before, we have two implementation, GLE, GDBE, uh, because they are on the GM la the layer, that means that any single file system can be put on top of the encryption. We don't need to have one encryption for that file system, one for this one. That's very useful. Uh, since very recently, on FreeBSD uh, 11, we can support full disk encryption uh, decrypted by the bootloader uh, using a passphrase. Um, we also support not in the development uh, file system level uh, no, in the port three, uh, but it's developed for FreeBSD by a FreeBSD developer file system level in, uh, encryption implementation, which is called BFS, okay. uh, which allows to encrypt only some directories uh, or whatever the file of the file system is under the hood. Yeah, the way we do uh, this encryption on, uh, on OpenBSD uh, is similar to how we uh, manage uh, red devices actually. Um, by using the uh, device control utility. Uh, that's what we use to, uh, to uh, set up software, right, or even control hardware, uh, right, uh, for, for the, the hardware device that we are to support. Uh, so it's, it's already very familiar for people. Uh, we have support for full disk encryption, obviously, uh, it's created by the, uh, the bootloader, uh, using the password phrase or pass key or uh, using on a USB dongle or, or similar. Uh, I guess we need to check that over here. Yeah, by the way, uh, swap encryption on works through GLE, basically. Well, swap encryption on OpenBSD has been enabled for eons now, uh, and by default. So uh, there's actually nothing uh, you need to do. Uh, you, you can disable it. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning it because that's that's kind of an exception uh, for security practice on OpenBSD. Um, but on very like very old and slow machines uh, that you only use for, uh, for uh, playing around, uh, then it doesn't really make sense to run. Uh, yeah, okay. let's move the storage away from you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so 
So I was mentioning that by default our, our swap, swap is encrypted, um, and that's something I like about OpenBSD, uh, are the, uh, the default uh, choice uh, of, of features and the way that the operating system is, uh, is behaving. Uh, it can sometimes it takes completely a ridiculous discussion that takes like weeks to know whether we're going to enable that like stupid stuff. Uh, but you can, in, in the end, it's very important. I think we have a very consistent system in the way that that it was really thought of. Uh, that's really what I liked about it. Um, and that's how we actually ended up with what I think are very easy to use uh, uh, genomes. Um, if we take the list of everything that has been uh, implemented, uh, like BGPD, uh, RealAD, uh, CARB, IPsec, and I mean, all, all the technology that's coming from OpenBSD is usually very easy to use. And I've, I've actually seen people understand networking by just in the configuration uh, file of like uh, open that you can use. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's true that OpenBSD is full feature in the network area with the demons you, you, you said, but FreeBSD is also quite good in, in that area. Uh, we have a lot of very easy to use features, VXLAN, VXLAN CARP. Uh, the feed for the network, the image, net, net, map, IPsec, and stuff like that. But back to the base system, um, having all those demons everywhere uh, make a, a huge base system. Uh, could, could, not, could you not just install ports for all of those? Well, we consider OpenBSD a general purpose OS uh, that should provide a useful number of services out of the box. Uh, it's, in, it's an important design decision because it means that all these tools have to be developed together. Uh, like a change in a kernel or a library uh, will immediately trigger some uh, modification in this daemon when need be. Uh, while if it were if they were part of ports, then maybe it would take a few weeks before someone noticed that the runtime is actually broken or something like that. Also encourages uh, code synchronization uh, between the different uh, uh, demons in the base system. Uh, and and for, for one, I'm, I'm very happy to have so many features uh, uh, in my OS without having to install anything. Uh, and the funny thing is that OpenBSD base system is actually smaller than FreeBSD. Really? I'm not sure. How are you guys on the virtualization side or running something external? Because um, well, on FreeBSD we support uh, running Linux binaries natively through an emulation layer. Um, we do support, uh, we can even run some, uh, some, we can even run some Linux into inside the gel. Uh, we can run very old, uh, very old compatibility of the binary. So you can run, for example, if you need FreeBSD 4 inside the gel. We have uh, native virtualization tools with Beehive, we support also uh, the other, other virtualization tools like uh, Zen and uh, Azadon Zero and Azadon New, uh, or VirtualBox, uh, which is available in the ports. Well, having, uh, having vendor people also being FreeBSD uh, developer does help in that regard. Um, I think it boils down to the fact that you guys uh, made a decision a long time ago uh, to basically not fuck with the hardware as much as possible and let the actual manufacturer uh, come and, and work with you. Um, I have no opinion about it. Uh, what I know is that an OpenBSD would prefer to try and convince uh, the vendor to open their specification and, and give us, uh, lend us some hardware so that we uh, write the driver. Um, I guess your approach is probably more pragmatic, uh, for sure. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's not a black and white situation. I honestly have, have absolutely uh, uh, no preference. Uh, uh, since you mentioned uh, virtualization, <laughs> um, Okay, well, uh, we, we do have VMM, obviously, which is uh, which is sort of in, in its infancy, but I guess close to be production already. There's, there's a couple of stuff missing, but uh, it, it works it works, uh, it works uh, pretty reliably now. Um, I, currently, you can only uh, 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 use uh, OpenBSD uh, guests. Uh, I think with the height, you can have NetBSD guests as well. Uh, but for now, you, you can't run Linux or anything else. Um, yeah. What about 
D is here to that stuff. I think we can both agree on the on that situation. That takes sucks? Well, we both suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well desktop is uh Okay, there's some very nice part about it, and there are some very horrible part. Yeah. Uh, I guess I guess anything that uh, that is related to uh, to uh, wireless LAN uh, drivers or, or uh, display drivers uh, is is not the situation isn't great. Uh, however, if you take things like uh, on the software side, like uh, GNOME KDE, uh, XFCE, whatever, LibreOffice, uh, Mozilla. Uh, Everything like that. I think we're in pretty good shape, actually. I mean, I mean most of the time, uh, I'm actually the head of uh, whatever Linux distribution is uh, in terms of, of the version. Uh, upstream are usually pretty okay to deal with. Yeah, and same with us in that case. Yeah, yeah there, there's a few Nazis uh, here and there, uh, but uh, most of the time they're, they're actually are pretty happy that uh, they are able to run something else on uh, yeah. Linux. And also, we do have a few developers that are also like Mozilla developer or LibreOffice developer or something like that. Yeah, so, um... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so all the things I consider, I think it's pretty really obvious that my DSD sucks as any user. Well, I agree that I disagree on that one. Uh, it's pretty clear that mine sucks as any user. That says, well, I think there are areas where we both suck the same. We talk about uh, wireless, yeah. the drivers, yeah, and cool. yeah, we both suck there. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, as much as uh, we like to make fun of each other, uh, we are not only sharing bad things. No, I do Well, I think there is some real cross pollination uh, between uh, between uh, our two projects. Uh, that works quite well. Uh, we had to do each other a lot of things, uh, and it would not make sense to. Uh, to uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, OpenBSD, in um, in my opinion, has an important role uh, in the open source uh, ecosystem in open source land. Uh, you guys are talking very important uh, projects, which should probably never have happened otherwise. Uh, the most famous had one uh, that comes to my mind is obviously OpenSSH, but there are others. We know that. Uh, I really like how open uh, you are to, uh, to portability of all the software, so you just make them ready to use elsewhere than on OpenBSD. Uh, I mean, OpenSMTP is the same, DMX, DMX is the same, Mandoc. Um, and often you're teaching a lot of upstream about good and secure coding practice, so that's pretty good to have. You're still there. So nice. See? Okay, I think for BSD is important in the global ecosystem as well. Uh, it's a real uh, enterprise operating system. Uh, I personally think it's kind of filling the spot left by uh, Solaris. Um, it bundled some amazing pieces of technology. I mean, you mentioned ZFS. Uh, people hate it, people love it, but it's still an amazing piece of technology. Uh, and in some area, uh, you're, you're, you're still on the edge of innovation, which is, uh, which is nice. Uh, there's obviously some very large uh, entities that uh, that use FreeBSD, and thanks to you guys, uh, a lot of people have been made aware of the uh, BSD community in general. Um, so for me, it's a good weapon to make people aware that fringe operating systems are simply not lagging behind uh, things. Yeah. For me, I would say, uh, the, uh, yeah, I would say the conclusion that. FreeBSD is a wonderful operating system, in my opinion, uh, very flexible, making attractive, uh, being attractive for almost all use cases. Uh, the project is very open, and everyone from vendors to individual uh, can uh, can find a place in the project. Uh, when there are a lot of vendors to that contribute to FreeBSD, the project remains uh, completely community driven, and individual can easily find a place in the project. As an example, in less than two years, I was able to bring some of the very important modifications that happened in the last, the last year. And I'm not related to any company, I'm just an individual, and now I'm part of the core team. And yeah, as far as uh, I see uh, uh, OpenBSD, uh, we're, we're still a very small project, uh, but I'm proud to see what we're about, about to. Uh, but we're able sorry, to achieve in some area with such a small amount of uh, actually active developers. Uh, and then we can actually compete uh, with a big uh, and, and founded operating system. Uh, 
uh, even sometimes deliberate things are happening. Uh, I would summarize it by saying that we do serious things without taking ourselves too seriously. Um, <laughs> that's true, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you guys say our performance sucks, so we say your security sucks. I guess there's some truth in both uh, stereotypes. Uh, I see OpenBSD as some kind of uh, incubator, uh, I like a bedrock for new technology because we're, if we're not afraid to break things, uh, sector is sort of destroyed to be able to do and, uh, and uh, I would not encourage people to uh, to actually use it, uh, use it for real as a power user, because I have, I have a lot of people from within the BSD community that actually don't know, uh, and I'm really surprised uh, that don't know anything about how OpenBSD actually works. Uh, I mean, I sure I love OpenBSD, but I try everything all the time. Uh, so, and um, yeah, um, I guess that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for listening.